Hi everybody, I'm Challenger Jacku and welcome back to the finale of our No Ring Challenge series. When we take on the last story of Sonic Adventure 2 to see whether it's possible to beat the game without collecting any rings. If you haven't watched the previous two parts where we took on both the hero and dark stories respectively, I highly recommend you do so and the links will be in the description below. However, before we begin, if you love Sonic content or challenge videos in general and you want to see more content like this on the channel, do me a favour and smash the subscribe button, like the video and hit that naughty bell. And as always, thank you so much for your continuous support. Now as always, I'll quickly go over the rules of this challenge, although they're pretty self-explanatory at this point. First of all, if you collect a ring at any point, it counts to the fail and we have to restart the stage. Next, the run will begin at Cannon's Court and will conclude upon the defeat of Final Hazard. And finally, yes, this run will be glitchless as they weren't really needed during the rating. Now, without any further ado, let's jump straight in. Our journey picks up from where we previously left off. With all seven Chaos Emeralds now in his possession, Eggman attempts to fire the Eclipse Cannon, only to be confronted with a video file of his late grandfather, Gerald Robotnik. Secretly reprogramming both the Eclipse Cannon and Shadow's memories during his incarceration, the group witnessed the events of Gerald's execution in his cell via a fire squad. During his confession, the deranged scientist condensed the world for Gunn's actions on that fateful day, killing both his granddaughter and Maria and all the other researchers in a bid to keep the secrets of Project Shadow buried away from the public eye. In order to enact his revenge, once all seven Chaos Emeralds are collected, Gerald's program will initiate putting the Space Colony Arc on a collision course with the Earth below, destroying humanity in the process. A ploy Shadow put into motion by manipulating Eggman, using his ambitions for world domination to essentially string him along into achieving his own desire for revenge. Everything about this is just so unsettling as an adult, so you can imagine the nightmare fuel this must have had for thousands of kids who experienced this first hand. If anything, it becomes even more disturbing as you get older, and suddenly start to notice the implication the game leads up to your interpretation. Whilst Gerald was ultimately in the wrong, I can't help but feel sympathy for him to be honest. By all accounts, he and his family are tragic figures, pawns used by the government to be disposed of when they were no longer needed, showcasing the utter worst of what humanity has to offer in their greed. The emotion behind his voice gradually transforming from a person overcome by grief, to the stubborn conviction of a broken man, wanting nothing more but to watch the world burn. The cannons core now highly reactive thanks to the limitless energy of the emeralds. The gang form an unlikely partnership with both Rouge and Dr. Eggman in order to shut down the core before it's too late. Now cannons core is the final action stage of this entire challenge and pretty much serves as a gauntlet so to speak, consisting of several bite-sized stages utilising each of the characters to truly test your mastery of each of the player styles. All in all, I really enjoy this approach when all of the characters work together to achieve a single objective and I guess so did Sega, as this trend that originated here continued all the way up to Sonic 06. The first portion of Cannon's core revolves around the mech gameplay, as Tails is tasked with destroying the security door, so the rest can traverse deeper into the core of the arc. Whilst ring trails are quite prevalent in this section, they aren't really difficult to avoid, as the corridors are wide enough for us to simply pass by them, reminiscent of both Lost Colony and Eternal Engine. The main gimmick of Cannon's core is honestly really creative. You see, throughout this entire gauntlet, there are these hourglasses placed either along the walls or on the ground. By activating them, this will stop time for a brief moment, which is required to beat the stage either by solving puzzles, deactivating laser gates for a fleeting moment, or even allowing you to destroy the artificial chaos, regardless of whether their weak spot is exposed or not. This alone makes a stage that appears rather difficult on paper a breeze to dash through, as long as you don't dawdle for too long. To be perfectly honest, Tails' portion of this stage is rather short. For the first few ring trails, we simply hug the sides of the corridors, only defeating the enemies that were directly in our path, like the gun mech and those annoying artificial chaos. Because I was a bit too hesitant due to my unfamiliarity with the layout, we unfortunately couldn't reach said Chaos Monster whilst time was still frozen, forcing us to deal with it the hard way, which did lead to us taking a bit of damage as a result as we reached the descending platform. As there aren't any ring containers about, you don't have to be careful when it comes to dispatching the gun beetles in this section. Upon reaching the next door, we destroyed the exploding parks, clearing the way whilst Big the Cat hangs onto the side of the wall for dear life. How did he even get here anyway? Ahead there is a laser gear that pretty much blocks our path, however the game pretty much places an hourglass directly ahead of you in order to force the player into learning the mechanic. Since they also freeze the enemies ahead of you as well, you should have more than enough time to hover down to the door below unscathed. Like before, all we need to do is hug the walls of the stage and you have more than enough room to evade the rings completely. The artificial chaos were what I was the most concerned about though. Usually you would need to wait until they expose their head, which serves as the weak point. However, this pretty much guarantees you'll take a hit. Instead, I just opt to spam the B button whilst it does take a bit of time, eventually one of your homing shots will connect, clearing the way forward. And once we climb over the 
crushes thanks to the hourglass, we reach the final room in this section. What we need to do is reach the very end of the room, so we can destroy the door with the tornado's pellets. However, our path appears to be blocked off by the many laser gates. There's a platform that we can potentially use, unfortunately though its path puts us on a direct collision course with a ring trail. It turns out if you wait until one of the crushes on either side have grounded, you can stop time with the hourglass and use them as a higher platform to reach the sealed door, as the laser gates will also deactivate whilst time is frozen. With that, we've cleared the first section of the stage, allowing us to move on. Section 2 is yet another mech stage, this time with Eggman. Whilst a lot of the design remains consistent with the previous section, there definitely is a greater emphasis on combat, as we need to clear out the gun mechs before the door ahead will open. The ring placements remain just as generous, so we're able to simply hug the walls for most of Eggman's section. Aside from this one ring loop that's really awkward, as we need to destroy all of the gun mechs, and for some reason one of them just refuses to spawn unless we move closer towards it. Once we clear them out though, we take the rising platform to the next section of the stage, where not one, but two artificial chaos were waiting for us. Even with the spamming strategy, you're pretty much guaranteed to take a hit, which was fine. However, because of my impatience, I didn't notice the ring container placed ahead of the door, forcing Eggman to lock onto it. At this point, I really didn't want to restart, so I thought if I backtracked, maybe the lock on would deactivate if Eggman got too far away. And whilst this did actually work, I accidentally fell into the bottomless pit, forcing a restart anyway. What can I say? I'm an idiot. On the next attempt, we didn't lock onto the ring container, riding the pulley to the next section. To open the next door, we had to clear out another two gun mechs that didn't pose any problems for us thankfully. Although leading up to the final section we were forced into a corridor containing a double ring trail. Granted they were simple enough to avoid as the corridor was wide enough, although it was a bit too tense thanks to the artificial chaos shooting us down at range. Thanks to the hourglass the final chaos monster beyond the laser gate was simple enough to tear down, but this is where Cannon's core truly turned into a living hell. From this point on the stage pretty much evolved into nothing but the green acid water we saw all the way back in Crazy Gadget, and yes it can still damage you even if you activate the hourglass. To traverse this section on hand, we need to wait until the block platforms rise to the surface, and essentially use them as a bridge to reach the higher pathway. Everything was going rather well until we reached the lower portion of the room. You need to use the blocks that rise upward from the floor below, in order for us to open the next door located above us. Because I didn't know about the hourglass along the wall behind us, I had no other choice but to take a hit from the water, leaving Eggman in the yellow. We were able to stand along the red straights which allowed us to remain above the water thankfully, until the platform underneath us rise back up. It's just the fact that the health we had remaining was wasn't ideal in the slightest for what the rest of Eggman's section had in store for us, which became all the more apparent the moment we came face to face with another two artificial chaos. Even with our spamming strategy we were unfortunately at their mercy because of the ring trail placed in the literal centre of this corridor, meaning we were just simply unable to evade our extendable arms even if we wanted to. A checkpoint just before this room ensured that we didn't lose too much progress though, and so we were able to effortlessly clear them out on our next attempt to finally reach the end of this section. Identically to the previous section, the security door placed along the higher ledge cannot be reached with a standard jump. Instead, we need to ride the block platforms from before as a launch pad whilst affording the acid water. There aren't any laser gates here though, so as long as we activate the hourglass once the block is high enough for Eggman to simply hover across, we can finally clear this section ringless. With the mech portion of Cannon's core now cleared, Rouge is tasked with finding a switch within the dome in order to drain the liquid from the core itself. For the most part, Rouge and Knuckles' respective sections don't stray too far away from the treasure hunting gameplay style. Whilst we don't have a radar or emerald shards to collect this time around, they still revolve around the exploration aspects of hunting down a specific target. If you look around, you'll notice a waterfall blocking what appears to be an open corridor. The switch that we need to press is located beyond there. To clear the way, we need to stop time by using the hourglass placed at the peak of the tallest pillar in this open section, scaling from the shortest until we can reach the hourglass itself. Once time has stopped, we have just enough time to dash through the opening, however you need to be careful due to the ring trail in such a narrow section. And of course, the gun mech. I would advise you to take out the gun mech first as we have to backtrack through here later on, although I didn't in this case, as I pretty much panicked because of how long it actually took me to bypass the waterfall itself. It was here where we took an L. The next room is yet again filled with the green acid of Crazy Gadget, along with the square blocks that would traverse the corridors essentially blocking our way. We need to add to fit the hourglass whilst the corridor is open and that will allow us to enter the room with a switch. A room filled to the brim with chaos monsters. Wasting no time, I took out the one to the left. However, I just didn't have enough time to take out the main threat, and once time resumed it immediately killed us with its arms, forcing a restart. I wasn't thrilled at the fact that we had to go through this entire segment all over again, believe me. So this time I made sure to take out the right chaos monster before time resumed, hitting the switch so we can backtrack to the main section in order to drain the core. The way back wasn't too difficult as we managed to kill the gunmate whilst time was stopped, it's just that I wasn't quick enough to get back into the main room, and so we were stuck behind the waterfall. With no other choice we had to backtrack into the acid room to activate the switch for a final time. 
Bang, Bruh. managing to get out of the corridor this time to complete Ruji's section of Cannon's core. With the area now submerged in this golden water, Knuckles is tasked with finding the switch to the final security though. Now this in itself isn't too difficult, it's just that I rarely play this stage, so I kind of forgotten what we actually have to do here, so like a dumbass, I spent a good 3 minutes swimming through the section with just Cleaver Rouge, bewildered at the fact that the switch was nowhere to be seen. What you're actually supposed to do is this, there's a laser gate and an artificial chaos behind Knuckles' spawning point, we need to deactivate the laser gate by stopping time, so we can destroy the metal crates and continue on from there. Clearly I was overthinking this, as I initially thought that I needed to activate a switch to shut off the lasers. After a combined 10 minutes from two separate attempts, I eventually remembered what we had to do, stopping time by the hourglass and destroying the chaos monster to reach the next section. Beneath the metal crates was a spring that pushed us into the path of a pulley, allowing us to hit a switch that gets rid of the three laser bars you can see along the higher path of the waterfall. This is the section that Knuckles is forced to traverse, and believe me it's a massive pain in the ass. Fans love to joke about doing this entire segment without the air necklace, and whilst yeah that is difficult, try doing this ringless. Not only do we have to contend with a godly amount of artificial chaos, we also have to do so without taking a hit whatsoever, which is brutal when you consider Knuckles is completely vulnerable by swimming, so with no other option we just have to evade the things, and pray the cat hits us as we hit the switch to unlock the next door. For the rest of Knuckles' portion of the stage, we're forced into linear corridors, that will actually push you back due to the water currents if time isn't stopped. We have to be quick here, otherwise you're Arse will be forced to restart, especially if you push into the path of the many ring trails. My best advice here is to just spam the A button, so Knuckles will continue to push his head against the ceiling. I'm not entirely sure if this is actually faster, but it's how I've always managed to clear this Kaizo stage. Upon clearing the first corridor, we're placed into a shaft filled with lasers that of course we almost ran into. Just take it slow, weave in between the gaps and you should be fine. Fortunately, there is an hourglass placed right along the floor that we need to activate to clear the final corridor standing between us and the switch. This next section is really awkward due to how long this corridor actually is. You have these steel cages that we need to manoeuvre around, all the while making sure we hit the next hourglass just ahead, giving us enough time to escape. When Knuckles' movement speed is this abysmal underwater, the race to the hourglass was more brutal than it needed to be. Several times we failed this, forcing us back into the laser room so we could take another stab at it. We were lucky in the sense that Knuckles evaded the rings every single time it was pushed back into the previous room, despite how close he got relative to the ring trail. Evading the final steel crates, all we had to do was swim to the upper right corner of the room so we could evade the laser attacks on the chaos monsters. Fortunately, it wasn't the variant that could extend their arms, so they were easy to avoid. Finally clearing this section of the stage ringless. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Do I really need to say anything at this point? Yes, Cannon score unfortunately is impossible to beat without collecting rings, yet again through no fault of our own. For Sonic's section of the stage we start by hanging onto a rail, which doesn't look too bad right? I mean just jump off it. That's the problem though, for whatever reason you're locked onto this rail specifically, you don't actually gain control of Sonic until he gets off, and by then we've already collected a total of 8 rings along his path. Now am I upset? Yeah, I'm pretty pissed after everything we just had to go through to get here. It's fine though, because aside from this rail, nothing in this stage actually stops us from beating it ringless. This final section of Cannon's core is extremely short, only lasting around 30 seconds or so. To reach the core, we're forced into a number of homing attack chains to clear the bottom's pit. Whilst we have to do so over the artificial chaos, the Abel class prevents us from taking any major damage, and once we defeat the Gunmex and final chaos monster, this clears the door to the end of the stage. The Abel classes really came in clutch here, as we were easily able to somersault under the fence, before the water current pushed us back, avoiding the final rail completely to reach the water slide. Whatever you do or do not allow the water current to push you down the incline closest to Sonic, as this will push you into a bottomless pit. Instead, you need to home attack up the water and then ride down the other side, taking us through the tunnels in the form of snakeheads that really reminded me of that one section in Lost World. Whilst there are a bunch of ring trails here and you can't directly stop Sonic at all, I quickly figured out as long as you hug the wall to the right, you won't collect any of the rings here. There is just a big enough gap between the wall and the ring trails that Sonic can just about squeeze through without any problems, and with that we finally clear Cannon's score with a total of 8 rings. However, I am content with calling this a win in our favour, as not Nothing within the stage itself actually prevented us from doing so apart from an arbitrary set piece. Meanwhile, upon once again being left behind by the rest of her friends, Amy discovers Shadow in the research facility, staring down towards the earth as he used to do all those years ago. Now content with the fact that his promise to Maria was fast approaching, Amy confronts the ultimate life form in a bid to save the earth, pleading with Shadow to help them 
stop the Ark. And whilst acknowledging that those who are selfish do exist, there are also good people amongst them as well that are worth saving. The words that Amy uses awaken Shadow's latent memories of what really happened on the Ark that faithful day, rediscovering the true promise he actually made to his friend. With tears in his eyes, he races to the cannon's core himself, in order to fulfil the promise he made to both Maria and Amy. Successful in reaching the core, the duo of Sonic and Knuckles are confronted by the monstrosity sealed aboard the Space Colony 50 years ago, the prototype of the ultimate life form, the Bio Lizard. Having to contend with its new threat before they're able to reach the altar and stop the Chaos Emeralds, Shadow himself emerges at the core, ready to take on his sibling upon his sudden change of heart, allowing the pair to reach the altar in order to stop the Chaos Emeralds. Now the Bio Lizard holds a special place in my heart for being the first boss to absolutely decimate me as a child. This encounter took me hours upon hours on my very first playthrough of the game, although I have improved a lot since then, to the point where this oversized lizard poses no real threat. At least that's what I thought going in. On the surface, the Bio Lizard really isn't a tough boss. For one, it moves incredibly slow, its attacks have fair and clear telegraphs and its weak spot, the giant red button upon the life support machine, ensures that the player pretty much knows from the offset that's what you need to focus your attention on. While there are a myriad of issues that truly make the Bio Lizard an absolute chore to face under our stipulation, they're all tied to one aspect specifically, the time that's wasted in between each of its attacks. No matter what, the Bio Lizard will only expose its weak point after it's finished attacking you, whether it be by chasing Shadow around the arena, the two energy ball variants that it will barrage you with, or the pink egg things, meaning for most of this battle will be forced to wait up to 40 seconds per cycle before we have another chance to damage its weak spot. It's not uncommon for this battle to drag onward with over 3 minutes on a regular attempt, so as you can imagine, this becomes an infuriating in test of your patience if you die for whatever reason, in a lot of cases through no fault of your own due to the drink prevalent throughout the fight. In the first phase, the Bio Lizard would chase you around the arena for a good 30 seconds before it fatigues, so we had to make sure we kept at a distance but not too far. If you use Shadow Speed to circle around the thing, it will actually begin to chase you around the other side using its tail. What it tends to do is use the homing attack so we can keep away from the Bio Lizard itself without running head first into its ass. We can't even hug the outer wall of the arena either as multiple ring trails are placed in front of the invisible wall. When it eventually ties itself out, the Bio Lizard will expose the feeding tube as it turns its head. The tube serves as a grind rail that we have to use to reach the life support system damaging the poor thing with a homing attack. Fun fact, in the original Dreamcast version you could actually die here. Like the Egg Golem, Shadow is forced into a falling animation until he reaches the platform again, and thanks to this if you were unlucky enough to fall into the water, this would result in Shadow being pushed out of the arena and into the death plane. Now this issue was actually patched out in subsequent re-releases of the game, and whilst that is great, the solution to this problem only ended up making this battle even harder for us. Shadow could no longer die by falling into the water, however the game will lock him into place to ensure he lands on the platform, to the point where you can actually fall into one of the trails through no fault of your own. Now you can kind of home and attack away ever so slightly, it just isn't enough to evade the rings if you're placed directly upon them. Let me tell you, nothing is more infuriating than reaching the final hit point of the fight, only to be dropped directly onto a path of rings. For the rest of the battle, after the Bio Lizard tires out from chasing you, it will launch a barrage of these dark energy balls towards you in two variants. One along the ground that you will need to jump over, and doors launch in the air that we need to somersault under. From all of my many attempts, I'm pretty sure the patterns are consistent in each of the phases, so as long as you memorise them, they aren't too difficult to predict, unless the drank really messes you over. For whatever reason, sometimes the somersault can lock up, leading to multiple failed attempts whenever you need to jump over a grounded energy ball, yet Shadow simply refuses to jump. There was even a glitch that occurred where Shadow for some reason rolled instead of somersaulting, resulting in multiple resets. If you do manage to evade all of the energy balls though, this does open up the Bio Lizard once again, hitting the weak spot upon grinding up the feeding tube. Now the final phase of the fight begins after we've already landed 3 hits on the thing. For the most part our approach remains the same. We still have to run away until it tires out, evading the countless energy balls. However, instead of lowering its guard so we can use the rail to reach its weak point, the Bio Lizard will summon multiple of these pink eggs that we need to home and attack chain into to reach the life support system. You do have to be quick here as it will use them against us by throwing them at Shadow, and they actually have the ability to kill you mid homing attack. My best advice is to simply hold forward and take your time. If you try to rush through, Shadow won't lock onto the ace and you'll take damage as a result. It's also annoying as the homing attack isn't exactly foolproof, so you could end up homing into one of the eggs to the side rather than the weak point itself. At the end of the fight, the Bio Lizard will enter this desperation phase. By shifting the gravity, we sent Urborn into the floating state we already encountered in both Radical Highway and Green Forest. Thanks to this, Shadow is completely vulnerable to anything it can throw our way. What we have to do is weave in between of the orbiting eggs to land upon the life support unit so we can land the finishing blow. The eggs will orbit around the arena in a clockwise motion, and of course, it will even launch them towards us so we have to be quick. Whilst there is a big enough gap in between the eggs, this pretty much comes down to RNG and the cycle of the eggs themselves. If you hold upright on the 
analog state, you should have enough room to evade the bylaws of the tags. Although this did take multiple tries to find a generous cycle, however with that we finally defeat the bio lizard without collecting any rings. With the bio lizard's defeat, Knuckles using the power of the Master Emerald and the Asian Trap made famous by the cow, succeeds in neutralising the Chaos Emeralds, halting the Space Colony's crash course into the Earth below. At least until the bio lizard in the last ditch attempt in fulfilling Gerald's desire for revenge, utilises the power of the Chaos Emeralds through Chaos Control, vanishing from the core and merging with the Space Colony to drag the Ark down into the Earth's atmosphere itself. With no other options left, the two Hedgehogs enter their super forms, combining their strengths to overcome this final hazard of the run. Now the final hazard... <laughs> no! Why? Why do you do this, Asuka? Alright, I'm sorry. Now the final hazard is pretty standard when it pertains to the other supersonic encounters present in the series up until this point. Thanks in part to the anal probe, the bio lizard is apparently now strong enough to combat both supersonic and shadow due to the energy of the chaos emeralds and the space colony arc itself. However, this all comes at the cost of its immortality, due to the destruction of its life support system and the harsh conditions of space. The surface of its skin continuously damages itself revealing the large red tumours along its body. By ramming into the swelling, this will in turn deal damage to the bio lizard. Like every other supersonic encounter, we start off with a total of 50 rings, losing the life if our ring count drops to zero. Now the bio lizard can't actually actually damage you here, the best it can do is repel either hedgehog through a magnitude of attacks. The egg things return no sport in a deep red colorization, and a laser attack that can be rather annoying to dodge due to their speed. You do not want to get hit by them whatsoever. The controls for this battle is a lot to be desired to be quite honest. Both Sonic and Shadow take an incredibly long time to reach their top speed, making them appear rather clunky as a result. This alone can take away a ton of your ring count, if you unfortunately take too many hits and are sent backwards. But it's time to address the elephant in the room, and that's how you replenish your rings throughout this encounter. Unlike the perfect chaos fight, where there are actual ring trails placed throughout the stage, in the final hazard fight there are no rings present here at all. Instead, by either dealing damage to the bio lizard, or by flying over to the other side of the screen, the game will then switch the controls to either Sonic or Shadow in rotation. Depending on how quickly you hit the swelling, your ring count will usually be replaced by 40 or 50, and this begs the question, does this actually count as a ringless run if our ring count replenishes automatically? In this case, I'm inclined to believe that it does actually count, as there aren't any rings in the battle for us to physically collect and in that sense it's easily clearable without collecting any rings. But let me know what you guys think down below. Is this a valid attempt as the ring count is quite literally beyond our control in this case? In a last ditch attempt to save the earth, Sonic and Shadow clash with the bio lizard for a final time, charging up a super chaos control capable of obliterating the prototype and warping the arc away from its collision course in the process. With the earth now saved and Maria's dying wish fulfilled, Shadow is unfortunately unable to maintain his super form any longer, free falling towards the earth. His sacrifice righting the wrongs of both his misguided actions and the vengeance of his creator, concluding this challenge series with the knowledge that no, you unfortunately cannot beat Sonic Adventure 2 without collecting any rings. And with that, we've reached a conclusion to the final part of this series. Yet another massive L on our record. However, overall, it was definitely interesting to discover the sheer amount of mandatory rings that we were forced to collect through no fault of our own, really. I expected stages like Mad Space to cause us a ton of problems for sure, but I was surprised to see that it was for a completely different reason altogether. Everything else that this challenge threw at us when we had full control over the characters, we were able to overcome, and so I can take away that small victory as we move on. So before we put this series to bed, I just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you who have supported this channel so far. It's thanks to you guys that I'm actually able to do this, and it's just incredible how far we've come as a community in such a short time, so thank you. So with all of that said, join us next week when we take on Sonic Generations to see where it's possible to beat the game as Super Mario? That's right, for the next few weeks we'll be taking a short break from the ringless challenges, as both Sonic Heroes and Shadow the Hedgehog are huge games in their own right, and so I just want to take a small break before we take on such an adventure. Instead, I will finally be taking on the challenges that you guys have requested over the past few months. So if there's a challenge that you'd really like to see me take on, now is the time to suggest them down in the comments below. For now though, I've taken up enough of your time. So take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye bye for now.